Well, good evening, uh, everybody. Let's see, it is um, it is our October edition of the Local History Guild. Um, my name is Mike Dyer. I'm the Curator of Maritime History here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And uh, I'm here to welcome welcome you to the uh, to the program this evening. Um, this was uh, we have um, we have some pretty serious Melville scholars and maritime uh, maritime you're both maritime scholars, right? Maritime history scholars. Mar Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, you know, Mary Kay, you're you're actually the um, you're actually the director of a maritime program at the University of Connecticut. Is that right? Yes, I'm the director of the Maritime Studies Program at the University of Connecticut, which is only one of only three uh, four-year Maritime Studies programs yeah. in the United States. Yeah, how about that? And and you've been writing about Melville for pretty much your whole career. That's true. Very true. And you've sailed around the world, and you're a deep-sea sailor, and you work at Mystic Seaport. Yep, I have 58,000 miles at sea, all under sail. Wow. And uh, and And... You and Bob were in grad school together. Bob, you're at the at the Coast Guard Academy, and what, what did you you you're, you specialized as, as a scholar of of Cooper and Melville and sea literature? Yes, and occasionally even taught Shakespeare, uh -huh. including a seminar on the Tempest, which was his nautical play. So where are you now? I tutor at the Coast Guard Academy. Well, uh, thank you both for for coming out this evening to, to talk about you know all hands Yankee whaling in the U.S. Navy. If um, you know that's the uh, that's the exhibit that's up, and I was the curator of of that uh, exhibit, and um, and uh, both Bob and Mary Kay have contributed um, chapters to the to the catalog, which is out now. All hands. Um, <clears throat> Mary Kay's chapter is a, a whaleman in the foretop. Herman Melville joins the U.S. Navy. Look at that! There he is. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, and Bob uh, Bob Madison uh, wrote about uh, Matthew Fontaine Maury through the paths of the seas, um, and these uh, you know choosing these two chapters um, re really as a uh, really is kind of a synopsis of the show because they're they're both they're both a, a micro look at the subject and a macro look at the subject. Um, which, you know, is kind of a, it's an interesting subject as it turns out, um, from my point, you know, from my point of view, it was, you know, you, you look at, you, I've been looking at these stories, you know, for my whole career, looking at Scrimshaw with patriotic and naval motifs, naval engagement pictures, you know, uh, images derived from Abel Bowen and from, um, uh, from other books and, um, and, you know, reading about the mutiny on the globe and reading about the U.S. exploring expedition and reading about David Porter and reading about, you know, Herman Melville and White Jacket and 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 looking at the charts that Matthew Fontaine Maury compiled and, you know, going through, you know, seeing in the logbook and journal collection that, you know, people actually transcribe these whaling, uh, whaling logbooks and journals, you know, for the for the uh, U.S. Naval Observatory and uh, and all of these stories exist individually um but i got very very intrigued about that uh that there's there's a there's a larger theme to address so uh, i'm gonna um uh, i'm gonna open the the local history guild with 19 slides we'll go through the slides very quickly it'll just sort of give folks that aren't familiar uh a uh, a general overview um and then uh, and then we'll then we'll chat with mary Kay and and Bob about uh, what what they think this all means. Um, so uh, let me share my screen here, and uh, and we'll we'll go through it. Oh, and we have a special treat when we hit uh, when we hit slide seventeen. Um, I will. Uh, it'll be a special surprise. You get your get your popcorn out for that one. That's that's going to be fun. Um, so let me share my screen here. All right, so here we go. Uh, all hands, Yankee whaling in the U.S. Navy, and uh, we're starting right off the bat with a um, with a piece of scrimshaw, you know, that shows the classic view of the Navy tar. So this is a sperm whale tooth engraved with uh, engraved with a figure of a 
of a, a U.S. Navy sailor, and we know he's a U.S. Navy sailor because he's got that the cannon and the and the cannonballs, um, and uh, and he's holding aloft a a, a a navigating instrument, a quadrant, and he's got the U.S. flag right there, and and uh, you know this is a this is a pretty proud symbol uh, of um, American maritime culture engraved by a whaleman on a tooth, you know, showing a, showing a, a Navy tar, you know, a Navy seaman. And we sort of have to ask, wonder ourselves, you know, was it a, was it a, was it a whaleman who joined the Navy who did a piece of scrimshaw like this, or was it um, some, um, some Navy tar himself who wound up in the whale fishery uh, and did the scrimshaw, or was it simply a, a, a whaleman who was very proud of, of national maritime uh, culture and the successes of the U.S. Navy in the uh, in the early part of the 19th century in the War of 1812, or is it all of those things? <clears throat> okay, I'm having trouble. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Hmm. Okay, so uh, from the get go, from uh, May of 1775, when the HMS Falcon. Uh, sailed into Buzzards Bay um, and uh, and uh, raided the local shipping. Uh, Fairhaven uh, militia uh, jumped on board a local whaling sloop, the Sloop Success, and they sailed out into Buzzards Bay to engage the the uh, the, uh, the Royal Navy, uh, Royal Navy uh, out in Buzzards Bay in, in a battle uh, to uh, to uh, secure. Uh, a couple of ships or a couple of small craft that were that, that were out there in the bay. So, um, right from the very beginning of um, of the American Revolution, uh, these you know whalers and whale ships were were involved in naval operations. Uh, we see a view here of, of Fort Phoenix at Fair Haven, and it just so happens that uh, after the first Continental Navy. Um, uh, expedition to the Bahamas where uh, Isaac Hopt Hopkins actually captured a, a British fort and a bunch of cannon and a bunch of uh, black powder and, and ammunition. Uh, two of the cannon from that operation were installed at Fort Phoenix. So we right away you see you know whaling and the Navy are, are, are tied up. They, they begin to uh, they begin to, to, to feed off each other. This is, an, this is an important part of this whole story. When you think of the way navies operate in the world uh, and what, what the point, you know, very often, you know, what, what are the points of, of, of a navy and very often there's some sort of imperialism, uh, um, some sort of conquering, um, that goes on, but uh, but according to uh, to the American point of view, you know, at, at the turn of the at the turn of the nineteenth century, the navy was built to defend commerce. Now, that is a very very interesting American idea uh, that that you're you're building a navy to defend business. Uh, that it's not necessarily an, an imperial. Uh, navy going out to conquer your enemies more it's it's a navy that's going out to defend your right to do business on the high seas and i i find that a, ver a very interesting and compelling idea um, you know right again you know from the beginning this this fellow george claghorn was a shipwright in bedford village and, and he served at the battle of bunker hill and um, through one thing and another he he was hired uh, to to uh, to be in charge of the shipyard at Charlestown and building of the frigate Constitution. Uh, so, you know, Claghorn himself uh, was very very proud of this, and apparent to the point of um, my understanding from my reading is, is that uh, he got to be really annoying. Like people, like people would cross the street to avoid this guy uh, because that's all he would do is talk about how great he was for building the U.S. Constitution. You know, the Constitution will become the pride and ornament of the American race. 
and you can, it's good to hear it once, but maybe it might get a little tiresome if that's all you ever hear from the guy. Uh, but you know, the fact is, is that he, uh, is that in addition to building the constitution, he built a number of whalers. Uh, one of which was the, um, was the Barclay and the ship Barclay, uh, will figure here by and by, um, in our, in the next couple of slides, um, you know, the ship Barclay was, was in the Pacific when, um, was whaling in the Pacific with some other Yankee whalers when the British Navy turned up and uh, and captured the vessels and imprisoned the crews. And uh, David Porter, who was uh, commanded the frigate Essex, <clears throat> unsanctioned by Uncle Sam, sails around Cape Horn and into the Pacific Ocean. And he says, you know, uh, he, he says, I, and now I shall notice the important services rendered by our coming into the Pacific. We have effectually prevented them from doing any injury to our whale ships, only two of which have been captured and their captures took place before our arrival. One of those uh, vessels was the Barclay, built by George Claghorn and commanded by a guy named uh, Gideon Randall, okay? Um, and Gideon Randall had a son and his son's name was George. And George became a, a, a whaling merchant uh, and a whaling agent and he owned whale ships and he had a son, and his son was named William Pritchard Randall, and he was a whaleman, and he went through several voyages, and he was on the verge of commanding his first voyage when the Civil War broke out, and, and William Pritchard Randall joins the Navy, and, uh, and he's uh, an acting master on the, uh, on the USS Cumberland, and he famously is the last man firing the cannons on the, as the USS Cumberland sinks uh, in the Battle of Hampton Roads, uh, and um, uh, and you know he he became this uh, he became this hero of, of the Civil War, you know, and now there's something to this. There's there's something to this uh, where you know the whaling grandfather uh, is 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 rescued. Uh, you know, he's sailing a ship built by the guy who built the Constitution, and he's rescued in the Pacific by the by David Porter and USS Essex, and then the grandson go, you know, joins the Navy, and he's commanding the, you know, the 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 big guns on the USS Cumberland in the Battle of Hampton Roads, and there there he is, uh, you know, here he is, uh, right, you know, right there, seated with his dress sword, and um, uh, there's. There's more to this than meets the eye. This is a real uh, thread of American maritime culture that we're seeing here. Uh, you know, anybody who studies whaling history knows the story of the of the mutiny on the globe. You know, it was like the one of the most horrific uh, events. Um, and uh, you know, George Comstock, uh, I'm sorry, Samuel Comstock sort of lost his mind uh, and um, and decided that he was going to command his own, he was going to become king of his own island in the Pacific. And the way he was going to do that was by sailing on a whale ship uh, and seizing the whale ship and killing everybody on board and sailing the whale ship to his private island. And he was going to become king of the island. And he did all of that, <laughs> except when he got to the island, they, uh, the islanders and his crew members all... Uh, recognized that he was nutty as a fruitcake and they and he was killed um, however the uh, surviving crew members sailed the ship back to uh, back to Peru where the Pacific Squadron was located and uh, and by and by the Pacific Squadron sent out the uh, the uh, US schooner Dolphin under Blackjack Percival to uh, to round up any of the mutineers or any of the survivors of the mutiny so this was in, this was actually the, the first American police action in the Pacific was conducted by the U.S. schooner Dolphin to round up mutineers from a whale ship. So that's interesting too. I just came across this drawing as I was putting the, the um, PowerPoint together. It's a pretty cool drawing. There's that Navy tar again, same guy, um, hmm. you know, with the flag and the and his uh, and his uh, you know the stars on his lapel and his uh, you know standing next to the cannon and the fouled anchor. Um, so, you know, it's just a drawing in a whaleman's journal, but uh, it implies a strong degree of patriotism. And here's our favorite, uh, Bob, um, Long Tom Coffin. 
uh, you know, James Fenmore Cooper, he, he was a midshipman in the Navy uh, in his youth. And then after that, later, he, he actually invested uh, money and owned a whale ship, the Union of Sag Harbor. But his, but his character in the pilot, Long Tom Coffin, was based on a Nantucket Continental Navy man named Reuben Chase, who himself, Chase himself, would later go on uh, to, uh, to own whale ships. And then Cooper would go on to write a history of the U.S. Navy. So um, there's another fascinating little bit. Um, here's Alexander Cornell again uh, on the on the ship Barclay of Westport. Not the same Barclay. It's a, a different Barclay. Um, uh, and he went aboard the um, he went aboard the U.S. Uh, brig of war Porpoise at um, in Cape Verde. This is the same uh, brig of war Porpoise that was that took part in the, in the U.S. exploring expedition, which, you know, was uh, the whole reason for the U.S. exploring expedition was to uh, chart the islands uh, of the Pacific where whale ships and sealers just kept running into them and, and shipwrecked and sinking uh, and running into all kinds of problems with the natives. And uh, it was, you know, essentially the, the work of one guy, Jeremiah Reynolds, who, uh, who was a kind of a, intellectual and a journalist and an explorer and he he exhorted uh the u.s congress to uh to put together this exploring expedition which they did but after a while they did um and they uh they sailed off into the into the pacific and for from 38 till 41 i think it was 42 um <clears throat> so you know the the collections that came out of the U.S. Exploring Expedition are the founding collection of the Smithsonian Institution. So our National Museum's founding collection emerged from a U.S. Navy expedition uh, to uh, to chart the islands on behalf of the whaling fleet. <laughs> so here's our here's our friend Herman Melville, um, and you know, he, as we all know, he was a whaleman. Uh, you know, he wrote Moby Dick. He sailed out to the Pacific in the 1840s, and then on his way in order to get home from the Pacific, he joined the Navy uh, and uh, and sailed back on the, on the frigate United States. And he wrote a great book about it, White Jacket or the World in a Man of War. And Mary Kay will tell us all about that here by and by. Um, just another, this is a Navy guy who uh, who carved a sperm whale tooth. He, he served on the US schooner dolphin in the Pacific and uh, must have learned while there uh, a, a bit about Scrimshaw and uh, that's how he got his hands on a sperm whale tooth because very shortly thereafter within a few years thereafter he was he uh, was serving in the Hobes home squadron in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, and drowned in a white squall um, he wasn't it probably wasn't doing Scrimshaw uh, in the Gulf of Mexico but he may well have been doing it in the Pacific Ferdinand Piper <clears throat> beautiful whaleman's drawing of the frigate USS Independence cruising off California in a war with Mexico. Um, and, you know, here are these, here are these loyal patriotic whalemen who go ashore from, you know, from uh, the, the, the ship ships, Edward and Magnolia of New Bedford to aid uh, the Marines in the, in the, in the battles and the war with Mexico. And they drew, drew this really cool picture in the journal. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's neat stuff, you know, and, um, you know, one of the, one of the great highlights of the show, you know, is, is this Cape Verdean immigrant whaleman, Joaquin Pease, who uh, goes on a whaling voyage and then war breaks out and he joins the Navy and he's on the USS Kearsarge. Uh, and he's in the battle of uh, at Cherbourg when uh, Kearsarge sunk the Alabama, which commanded by Raphael Sims. And Raphael Sims before the war worked for the US Navy and he bought, uh, he, he, he bought sperm oil for the U.S. Lighthouse Board uh, before he joined the Confederacy. Um, all right, here, here's, this, here's, the, here's this famous view of the Stone Fleet by Benjamin Russell. Now, what do we know about the, what do we think about the Stone Fleet, Mary Kay? Well, I thought I would just read um, Melville's poem about it. So this is part of Battle Pieces, published in 1866. And um, it's, here's the poem. It's called The Stone Fleet. An Old Sailor's Lament, December 1861. I have a feeling for those ships, each worn and ancient one, with great bluff bows and broad in the beam. I it was unkindly done, but so they serve the obsolete, even so stone fleet. You'll say I'm doting, do but think, 
I scudded round the horn in one. The tenados, a glorious, good old craft as ever run. Sunk, how all on meat, with the old stone fleet. An Indian ship of fame was she. Spices and shawls and fans she bore. A whaler when her wrinkles came. Turned off till, spent and poor. Her bones were old, as cheap. Ah, stone fleet. Far were erst per patrician keels. Names attest what families be. The Kensington and Richmond too, Leonidas and Lee. But now they have done their their seat with the old stone fleet. To scuttle them, a pirate deed, sank them and dismast. They sunk so low, they died so hard, but gurgling dropped at last. Their ghosts and gales repeat, woes us, stone fleet. And all for naught, the waters pass, currents will have their way. Nature is nobody's ally. Tis well, the harbor is bettered will stay a failure and complete was your old stone fleet. So uh, uh, as you probably know, they early in the war, um, they uh, decided to send um, uh, two fleets, ultimately two fleets of whale ships down to sink in the harbors of, of Charleston and Savannah to blockade the harbors. And so they bought first 25 um, old whale ships and then 20, they kept it a secret what they were buying them for but uh, they stripped them of everything except for one anchor, one set of chain, no chronometers, uh, food for the voyage, um, and then filled them with um, rocks and stones that were taken mostly from um, uh, stone walls in New England and sent them down. So totally dangerous to be sending them. They, they only had um, eight or nine crew on board, plus uh, two, um, two uh, mates, a captain and a cook. So they were sailed with very few few men, uh, 13 or so men on a vessel that would normally have sailed with about 20 men. And um, so just the, the whole act of getting down there. And then at first uh, they weren't sure what they, um, the, the commander down there wasn't sure what they were doing. There was all kinds of, of questions, but finally um, they were set uh, on the, the kind of the, sandbar outside Charleston, kind of in a um, checkerboard fashion, some on each side, and sunk. And then everything was taken from them and put on the Robin Hood. Um, and then, which I'm especially drawn to because it was owned by Mallory, Charles Mallory, who was, uh, uh, he, he was in Mystic, where Mystic Seaport Museum is now, and, um, and burnt, the, and then the other sink. And as Melville says, it did no good. <laughs> it's 18 days the 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 um harbor was pretty much opened and uh, within five months the the harbor the um entrance had drawn 16 feet but it was five feet deeper 21 feet uh down so the 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 ship seemed to have actually settled the the mud and sand down more so rather than blockading the harbor um it it kind of opened the harbor even more. And there was a huge international reaction. Uh, the, the, the language of, of newspapers from overseas about, you know, this, this is the worst deed ever done on earth to, to, to send these ships down to block up the, um, the harbors. But Melville writes in the voice of an old sailor who's uh, just thinking about the idea that these ships are obsolete and he's kind of obsolete. So that's just some thoughts about the stone fleet. Well, super. Thank you. Thanks for a nice reading, too. You know, hanging in the show is this red ensign that was captured uh, by the USS Memphis off the, off the coast of uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, there were probably whalemen involved uh, in, in the capture because uh, there were several ships involved and on them were uh, several uh, New Bedford whalemen. Uh, but, you know, one of the more interesting features to to this was I was trying to figure out how it came into the museum collection and uh, there was a guy named uh, the guy who donated it was named Oliver Brown and Oliver Brown was a carpet and ceramic salesman in New Bedford but Oliver Brown had his his dad's name his dad was born in in uh, 1813 and his dad's name was Oliver Hazard Perry Brown, <laughs> and he was a he was a whaling agent. Um, so you know there, there's there's a culture some some culture going on there. Um, and last but not least, of course, is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the Secretary of the Navy in the First World War. Uh, he was descended from whalers on his mother's side, the Delanos of Fairhaven, 
and uh, and you know he concocted this. Well, he didn't concoct it. The the uh, the reality was that the the intensity of the shipping effort in the in the First World War uh, to convoy goods um, uh, across the Atlantic uh, was so great that the Navy did not have navigate enough navigating instruments to go around, and so uh, there was a there was a strong push on the part of the of uh, Uncle Sam to gather up navigating instruments. And we have two of them are in the exhibit. They've got the U S Navy calibration numbers uh, engraved on them. Um, so, um, and I think that's it. Yeah. So that's sort of an overview of the show, uh, but that's not really, uh, that's not really what the, the, um, the full detail here. So we'll go into, we'll go into this a little bit more. Um, what's it all about? I mean, you know, does this does this hold water as far as you guys are concerned? I mean, is, are these themes that you've in, you've encountered or thought about before in your, uh, you know, in your work? Sure. Shall I jump in? Yeah, of course. Well, the uh, um, this month actually celebrates the two hundredth anniversary of Cooper finishing up the pilot, the first sea novel. It would be published in January of 1824, and the Cooperians are going to celebrate that. So we've been doing a lot of work on the pilot. And the pilot, as Mary Kay knows, and you probably know too, was written in response to a book by Sir Walter Scott called The Pirate. And there's not much that's maritime in The Pirate, but a lot of people said that it was. It was, after all, named The Pirate. And Cooper wanted to write a response because he thought there was a lot more potential in the, the novel. So he decided to write a naval novel. And this is pretty unusual because we don't really have a strong naval literature the way that Great Britain has a naval literature. And British literature is just crawling with naval officers all over. James Bond is a commander in the Royal Navy, you know, things like that. That's a long tradition, and we didn't have that. Um, so that wasn't the direction that sea literature was going to take, even though he chose to write about a thwarted exploit of John Paul Jones, who's actually never named in the book. He appears as the, the pseudonymous Mr. Gray, who's the pilot for an American frigate and an American schooner. Now, this is the first work of sea fiction, and already it combines the naval side of things with the frigate and the whaling side of things because the coxswain of the schooner is the long tom coffin that you just talked about. And, of course, that vessel is not representative of American fighting vessels of the Revolution being a schooner, but it is representative of the sealing trade that was take for be, being formed at the same time and by 1819 when Cooper owned a sailing vessel was the same time that Palmer was down discovering Antarctica. And there's all these links. So one of the oddities of Cooper's book, um, Sir Walter Scott's book had a whale that swam ashore. So the local farmers tried to kill it and they didn't succeed. And uh, Scott, actually based that episode on a, a stranding of blackfish that had occurred in 1814 that he'd witnessed. But Cooper wanted to have a whale chase. And of course, just a couple of years ago, Cooper had owned a whale ship. Now, we don't think Cooper ever harpooned a whale, and he may never have seen a whale. It would really be an interesting thing to know. He did make a voyage as a young man, and then um, but when he joined the Navy, he was sent to Lake Ontario. So he wasn't out there looking at whales. But he, um, he did his research. He had owned this vessel. By, and we think that Cooper himself took a voyage on a schooner to deliver whale oil from Sag Harbor to Boston and possibly to some destinations in Narragansett Bay as well. So he had this experience in that kind of vessel. 
And he may even have taken a whaleboat from Sag Harbor over to Stonington because he writes about Stonington all the time, which ties us in with that other mammalian connection, the sealers and uh, Nathaniel Palmer. Uh, Cooper later had a character named Noah Polk. The initials, I think, are significant because they're Nathaniel Palmer's initials. He's an old Yankee sealing captain. So Cooper has a, a whale chase in the middle of this Revolutionary War novel based on the Navy. Um, and Long Tom Coppin just happens to have a harpoon in the whale boat and just happens to have a whale line, which is stunningly unlikely. But they, they go about it and they do harpoon their whale, but then they have to let it go because the, uh, the English show up in the, the local cutter and they have another encounter. But that was a tour de force that was simply planted there by Cooper to show this is the way to catch a whale. You don't wait till it washes ashore and then try to kill it with pitchforks. You go out with your harpoon and you take care of it. And so we import that. But from the very first of our tradition of the sea novel, we have that conjunction of the United States Navy and the whaling industry nailed right down to, to New Bedford and to Nantucket the way it should be. And then what happened, Mary Kay? <laughs> well, and so I was just going to talk a little about Melville here, um, but I do want to say that whale hunt scene in in, in uh, Cooper, every time I, I teach the pilot, as I just did earlier this semester, um, my students are always like, what? what is this scene doing in here? Because um, it, it's totally incongruous. And also, you know, um, Cooper does some odd things like he has the loggerhead in the front of the whale boat rather than the back of the whale boat. And he has um, Long Tom Coffin. Apparently he's such a good harpooner that he actually kills the whale, you know, with the harpoon <laughs> rather than killing it with later with the land. So um, it is it, it is funny, but I do like the connections Bob made. Um, so, uh, but, uh, so Melville, I, I, you know, Melville served first on a, um, he, he spent four years at sea and he served first on a merchant vessel sailing from New York to Liverpool and back to New York. And then uh, his family was sort of an upper middle class family that was suddenly thrust into poverty when his uh, father went bankrupt at when Melville was 10 and died when Melville was 12. So his mother was left with eight children and, um, not much way to make money. So that's partly why he went to sea as an ordinary sailor um, across the Atlantic. And then he joins the Kushnet on January 3rd, 1841 um, in um, Fairhaven, just across from New Bedford. And um, he serves on the Kushnet for about 18 months till he runs away um, in, Mar in the Marquesas. Then he serves on a second small whale ship named the Lucianne, uh, an Australian whale ship. And then he um, he is part of a mutiny on there, bloodless mutinies, incarcerated in a, a, a Tahitian jail, uh, escapes by basically walking away, he crosses to the island of of Morea, and then he um, joins his third whale ship, the Charles and Henry, um, which is a Nantucket whale ship. It's the first time he sort of has a lot of respect for the captain, and um, and serves on that until he gets to Lahaina, where he's discharged, and then makes his way to Honolulu where he joins the Navy. As you said, uh, he spends 14 months at sea aboard the United States, a frigate, the, the United States, very similar to the constitution. Um, and um, and during that time, he witnesses 163 floggings. So wow. he, he comes out with an absolute hatred of flogging. And I've always thought White Jacket, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned it, but White Jacket is a really interesting book because most naval books have uh, kind of the tension of having 470 or 500 men crammed aboard a, one ship um, with little place for all of them. Um, they, they usually break the tension by either having a storm or a, a battle. So then you, you can think, so then everybody's united in fighting the storm or the battle. But in, in White Jacket, Melville doesn't give us that sort of easy out. The, the whole book is an examination of the inhumanity of the the treatment of of ordinary sailors by by the United States Navy, and and he he forces you to pay attention to that 
and and doesn't give you the break. It doesn't break that sort of unbearable tension by having a storm or a um, or a a, a battle. Um, and so then Melville came home, and it's so interesting. So he served in in the merchant service, the whaling, the whaling trade, and the naval service. Um, and so one of the things I'm always intrigued with is that whenever you read one book, they um, the sailors on that type of vessel disparage the sailors on the other. So I'll just read you a little bit from White Jacket where Jack Chase, the great captain of the foretop, you know, handsome and intelligent and a great, great uh, sailor, um, berates Tubbs, who's a Nantucket whaleman. He says, why you limb of Nantucket, you train oil man, you see tallow strainer, you bobber after carrion. Do you pretend to vilify a man of war? Bah, you are full of the four peak in the forecastle. You are only familiar with Burton's and Billy Tackles. Your ambition never mounted above pig killing, which in my poor opinion is the proper phrase for whaling. So like he really insults, uh, Jack Chase really insults whaling. But yet when um, when uh, Ishmael tries to come aboard the, uh, the Pequot and Moby Dick, he says he's been in the merchant service and Peleg says, Merchant service be damned. Talk not that lingo to me. Dusty that leg. I'll take that leg away from thy stern if ever thou talkest of the merchant service to me again. Yes. So the merchant, so the merchant service is denigrated and whaling is seen as the great thing. And uh and then later in Red well, earlier actually, in Redburn, um the the back to whalemen being denigrated. Um so th there was a quote, this was Larry's first voyage in the merchant service. And that was the reason why hitherto he had been so reserved since he well knew that merchant seamen generally affect a certain superiority to blubber boilers as they contemptuously style those who hunt the Leviathan. So, you know, Melville has fun with that kind of, um, that, that way of looking at sailors from other trades, but yet he, he had served in so many of them. He had served in all three merchant, uh, whaling and, and, and Navy. And I, you know, I, so I think, especially with the work you've done, Mike, it's really made me reassess how incredibly fluid it was for sailors from one to the other. Yeah, there are a number of narr narrative, you know, firsthand narratives of these, of these, um, these men who, who leave home on one service and desert someplace and end up joining the other service. And they do this back and forth, back and forth across you know, the South Atlantic and into the Pacific Ocean. And they'll leave a whale ship and desert into the hills for a little while. And then they get tired of that and they'll join the Navy uh, because there, there's not as much work to do and the food is better. And, uh, and, and then they, they get tired of that and they run away again and join a whaler. Um, and because the whalers go into Tahiti or the Marquesas or wherever they want to go. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's really, really kind of interesting, you know, that you use the word fluid. Uh, and that that's a really, really good description, I think, Mary Kay. Um, you know, but uh, but, you know, there is a there is a macro story to all this, too. And, you know, which is which sort of transcends the way that the services look at each other, where, you know, where where we're talking about science. Where we're talking about, you know, the applied, you know, the gathering of data to be assessed for, uh, for, for to, to come up with some sort of determination of, of uh, oceanography, and and for that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you've got a journal or a logbook that somebody can read. Is is that is that right, Bob? Uh, it goes back even farther than that, because I think people kept journals almost as long as they went exploring any place. Columbus read enormously before he left for his expedition, which ended up here. Um, but his own journal wasn't discovered until shortly before the time period we're talking about. So it turns up in about 1800 in Spain, gets translated into English um, around 1830 for American readers and um, becomes sort of the archetypal 
journal of exploration. And it's very terse. We don't have his original journal. We just have La Casas's notes from it. So it's a very, it's very log bookish in the way that it's presented, which almost becomes a genre of writing in itself, where um, I don't know how many sea stories uh, we've read where, and now we're going to turn to the journal as I kept it in those two weeks or something like that. Uh, it's not exactly an epistolary novel, but it's pretty close. And so that does become an art form. And we think of these thousands of mates and skippers and so forth um, on all of these vessels, not just the whalers, but they're all out there. They're all keeping logs. The difference for the whalemen is that they don't make a passage. They're not out there to see if they can get to England in six weeks or four weeks or two weeks, um, which is, I don't know what they finally ended up. The Titanic was supposed to do it in, in about a week, wasn't it? But they're all keeping journals of these things. But the whalemen, are, they're not just going on a passage. They're going out. And so that journal may be... You know, there's this year's journal, and then there's next year's journal, and then there's the journal after that. And maybe if they're really lucky that third year, they'll be back. But what stories there are to tell there? And those guys, of course, as you know, because you have the biggest collection of them, they got bored with just keeping the latitude, longitude, weather, and that sort of thing. And so they become records of all kinds of stuff. What they saw is one of the biggest things. Um, what they discovered is huge because they went, they didn't go on trade routes. They went on animal routes. They were tracking animals where there were no tracks. So they really just wandered everywhere just on the hope that they'd find something that they could boil down for oil or collect for furs. And um, and they were the people who discovered everything, and they kept a record of it. So and we do have this. Didn't the Navy use all that information for some? The Navy. Good well, you're you're leading up into Maury. Now Maury, Maury recognized that journal keeping could be put to the use of science, and of course, the whole point of science is. You learn enough about the world so that you can predict things. That's what science is. You do enough experiences, experiments, and you know how they're going to turn out. You do enough experiments with the weather, and you can be pretty sure how it's going to turn out. You know that if you're going to sail to Ireland, you head up towards Nova Scotia and take a big loop around, and all the time you're riding the Gulf Stream. You know that if you're coming back, you go nearly to the Caribbean before you come across and come back up. So you go down to Africa, you go across towards the Caribbean, you come back up the coast, and that's the fastest way. Now, how did they know that? Ben, Benjamin Franklin knew about the Gulf Stream. That was something that everybody noticed, but nobody studied it. Nobody studied it. So how do you study it? How many logs are there? And Maury realized... Matthew Fountain Maury realized that the Navy had all of this stuff basically in a barn just waiting for him. They had all the records, so he started mining them. And he got his brother-in-law, Herndon, to start mining them. And Herndon's specialty was mining the records of whales. So that, and, and Herndon is really the one who gathered all the data that produced the whale charts that we all like to look at. So, but just unimaginable amounts of research. And I suppose a lot of people would find that dull to do, but Maury just had a mind that was just burning to find out what it all added up to. What does this all this wind data add up to? What does all this current data add up to? What, does, what do these sightings of seaweed add up to? And for us especially, what do all these sightings of whales add up to? And, uh, Maury's another guy that may never have seen a whale. And, and yet the work that he did on whale migration is still useful. It gives us a baseline. Well, I believe he never saw a whale because the worst pictures of whales ever drawn appear in Matthew Fontaine Maury's book. Do you have that saw, slide you saw, can bring up? Those sausage whales? Yeah. 
It's a great picture. I was, yeah, was looking yeah, at mine today. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin the. Um, okay, don't don't ruin the anticipation. But be honest. Where did he get those pictures? I don't know. Uh, I don't did know he get he them from Royce? Did he get them from? I don't know where he got them. I can't. I don't think I ever figured out. You know. Yeah. I don't think I ever. Figured there they out. are. There they are. The those are trailer. falling. But yeah, um, <laughs> I haven't been able. Were you ever able to find the killer whale pictures that he was sent? Oh. No, somebody drew some pictures. I imagine they were pretty awful, too. But these guys, I mean, it, you know, we all grew up with seeing whale stamps. So we all had a pretty decent idea of what the outline of a sperm whale looked like. But we're spoiled. Because all of these scientists, anybody who's de dealt with real whales, they usually ended up, and we're talking now in, in Melville's day, uh, they had to deal with dead whales. And dead whales are pretty flaccid, unimaginative looking things. Right. And they don't look anything like what we can see today with underwater photography of these magnificent animals swimming along. Can you imagine what Melville would have thought if he had seen those sausage whales? He well, that's how we know he didn't, because he would he couldn't have left that alone. He couldn't no, have. He have. <laughs> those would have been the monstrous pictures of whales. They are they yeah. are the worst. But it's really you know it is kind of cool to know you, you know that you know there was a U.S. collector of customs uh, in New Bedford was uh, Daniel McKenzie, who was a whaling master. And, and he actually, you know, put little ads in the in the local paper saying, you know, uh, you know, take these log books and fill them out for for Lieutenant Maury at the at the, at the U.S. Hydrographic Office. So I mean, he he was actually encouraging uh, encouraging this research. Uh, and we know, you know, in the show you'll see that there's at least one uh, one whaling journal that uh, Mackenzie himself transcribed for the for the um, for the observatory he calls it the national observatory mary Kay, what journal was that i don't know i was just thinking that maury was you know if it wasn't for the uh if it wasn't for for the um abstract log of the akushnet that's the only log log that we have of the akushnet that's the only way that we is. know what what wasn't he the guy who did it, who transcribed the Akushnet log? Oh, I don't know. I don't know that. Huh. But I, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It could be. I just don't remember. But that's um, in my notes somewhere. But that yeah. was that's interesting too because the the Akushnet voyage didn't keep an abstract log because they weren't doing it that early. This was the log came back was somewhere in New Bedford. One of these guys, the correspondence of Maury, dug it up and did his own abstract from it. And that's the thing that's preserved. So it's really, really lucky that we have that. And it was because of this systematic scientific process. And you, and you like like me, hope that that thing is still out there somewhere. In the I think it's somewhere. in somebody's attic in New Bedford. I really yeah. do. Because yeah. it didn't yeah. – we, uh, we used to think that it had gone to the Navy and the transcription had taken place, you know, in Washington, D.C. or someplace, and that maybe the original was in the National Archive somewhere, misfiled, as things do get. But after looking at this and working with the dates – it would have been one that was transcribed in New Bedford. And then there was this issue of his granddaughter showing up in New Bedford at the end of the century. And she writes a book on whaling. And you got to say, what was she doing in New Bedford? They were Virginians. And I think she was there selling whaling memorabilia that belonged to her father. Oh, wow. Interesting. Which again, you know, could have. Who knows? But I, yeah, I think that a cushionet log is out there someplace. And it's hey, by the way, that nice little map that you gave us is on exhibit. The one with the with the wind and current, the, the little polychrome one. Uh huh. 
Yeah, it looks nice. So thanks. Yeah, he got a lot of mileage out of those maps. And um, almost everything he did was um, for the government. So he wasn't making ancillary money off of it. And it was a friend of his who said, you know, you should do some books of your own because when the Navy money drives up, you're going to need an income. And so we did. And then turned to these geography books, which were in his lifetime much more famous than physical geography of the sea or the sailing directions explanations. They were, um, those geography books were everywhere. Hmm. So the whole idea holds water, yes? <laughs> so well, we, yes. Are we going to, um, do we do a, uh, Anybody out there have any questions for us? Yeah, we have. Yeah, there's there's Q and A. It's about that time, but uh, so far there's no questions in the chat. Um, uh, so you know, who knows? Maybe maybe everyone is is uh, so pleased uh, with the information that we've passed along that they don't they don't have any questions at all, uh, which is a possibility, I suppose. But uh, you know, it was really fun. It was it was, it was fun, and and in the, in the past couple of local history guild, we did one. Uh, we did one with Greg Gibson, uh, where he where he talked about the uh, you know the mutiny on the globe, and, and then we did one with Gordon Calhoun, you know, from the Naval History and Heritage Command Center, who spent you know uh, quite a lot of time studying William Pritchard Randall. Uh, so you know that it's really nice to you know to sort of round it out with uh, with with you all, um, and and cover you know. It's just funny how Melville always seems to land in the middle of this stuff. Okay, well, I it's all connected. All so you were talking about the mutiny of the globe and the Comstock book comes out in 1840. In 1842, it's the only mutiny in the United States Navy. And it probably wasn't even a mutiny, but it's perpetrated by this kid, Philip Spencer, right. who decides that he's going to get control of the ship, sail to a desert island, become king. Basically, it's the Comstock story reenacted, um, but with a different ending. He was the son of the Secretary of War. His, um, Alexander Slidell McKenzie, who was another Southerner, was the commander of the training ship on which he was a mate, and he hanged Spencer and two other sailors in 1842. Well, there was an enormous fallout because you don't hang the Secretary of War's son at sea when you're only a week from land, which is exactly what happened. So when they get back, Mackenzie's court-martialed. And in the court-martial, it comes out that he believes that Philip Spencer got the idea of the mutiny from reading all those James Fenimore Cooper novels. Well, yeah. he and Cooper were literary rivals anyway. But yeah. you have the archetype for the mutiny showing up in the Globe book, in the life of Samuel Comstock, being blamed on James Fenimore Cooper, being part of a Navy squabble. I mean, and I think through the century you find these things, they are going to go back and forth, as long as the pool of individuals remains the same. Once the Navy, after the Civil War, turns to power, the skill sets are different. So you don't have guys who are driving steam engines who the next voyage decide that they're going to go catch whales. So that the I think the, the intersection of the, of the sailors isn't, isn't possible. Hey, um, you know something though, Bob Robert Walter Weir was a whaleman before he joined the Navy and was an engineer on a steamer. So he did it just the opposite of what you okay, described. Well, <laughs> that's that's good. Um, one of the weirdest connections, I think, is not with our Navy, but with the British Navy. There was this admiral, and you know about him, um, Sir Isaac Coffin, Baronet, and Coffin. Like, come on, you and and he's from the Nantucket coffins, but in the revolution, he was on the other side. So he was a loyalist from that area, but you couldn't be a coffin and not have a whaling background and come from Nantucket. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy stuff. So I don't know how many of these whalemen also ended up 
feeding other navies all around the world. It's just by accident that um, Melville comes home, I think, on our naval vessel. He could just as easily have enlisted in an English naval vessel at you that know, time. You know, you we know? could have filled this show up with English patriotic scrimshaw. Probably. So in answer to Susan yeah. LeClaire's question, does America, American whaling have a relationship with the Navy from any other country? Um, you know, it's, it's, in our collection, uh, the, the, the scrimshaw collection just... You know the, the navy, the the British patriotic uh, scenes are um, just, they're, they're 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 as common as can be. So um, I don't know yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, the sperm whale industry is not as common as we are after Porter, and so it makes you wonder if these whales' teeth were like wampum. You know, are these the medium of exchange for sailors? Does some sailor, you're meeting some other vessel and he's got these teeth in his bag. I think the very first piece of scrimshaw you showed with the sailor on it, the initials on the bottom look suspiciously like HM. And I just thought, wouldn't it be nice if that was Herman Melville's <laughs> piece of scrimshaw? And wouldn't it be nice to think that when he was working at the bowling alley in Hawaii, uh, in between voyages that back home in his sea bag, he still had a dozen teeth or so that he would take with him on the United States. Well, there's a piece of scrimshaw out there that claims that that the tooth that was given to Herman Melville, you know, um, I don't I don't really buy it myself, but uh, but it but the story is out there. Um, uh, Bob DeManch wants to know whether there is any connection between whaling out of Newport and the early history of the Navy there. You know, uh, that would have been a that would have really quite been colonial. The Newport whaling um, kind of collapsed uh, after the after the Revolution, and there were a few voyages in the 19th century, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't nearly what you know what whaling had been in Newport in the colonial era. I'm not familiar with that, but of course, Newport was a tremendous port before the revolution as well. So it would make sense. It was, I think, a bigger port than anything else between New York and Boston. And that decline was rapid. I don't know why that would be. I mean, Narragansett Bay was still a magnificent harbor. But I think that especially after the advent of the railroad, Newport just gets bypassed. Because the big it population during the war. I mean, they, it, I mean, it suffered badly that port during during the revolution. But they were occupied. They should have been getting it. Actually, their economy should have been better because of the, of the English occupation. I don't know. You have to get some Newport historians on this show next time. Yeah. Okay. The history no of the port of Newport. And um, nobody likes to talk about Rhode Island ports, of course, anymore because. Apparently, their main item was slavery. Yeah, we could talk about the rum side. That's maybe cheerier. Horses. We did a nice program. Horses. The horses. Last, yes. The last program we did was about horse trade with the Caribbean and the slave. And, and the, uh, excuse me. In the in the in the in the eighteenth in the colonial era of slavery, and, and we learned all about the Narragansett Pacer, which is a pretty yes. great story. You don't know about Narragansett Pacers, you can look it up because they're pretty good. Cool. And the Narragansett Pacer shows up in The Last of the Mohicans, which is, is right? hard to believe. Yeah, he's there. It's one of those, wow. one of the two sisters, the Monroe sisters, is riding a Narragansett Pacer somewhere up north of Albany. So it's it's a just something that's just evaporated from our culture. And if you think about They've it, they've gone extinct. Yes, well, they were a breed anyway. Theoretically, yeah. you could breed them back. Yeah, well, but apparently if not. Melville, think about this. If Melville had not written Moby Dick, would we care at all about whales now? Or would they have just been gone? Would they be forgotten like the Narragansett Pacer? There really is nothing. I mean, yes, whales are everywhere. We see them intersect with all this naval stuff. But almost all of the culture, the material culture that surrounds both of those things has just evaporated. But there is this huge 
admiration for Melville and therefore a resurgence of interest in Wales. And I don't see that resurgence of interest in manatees, for instance. Somebody told me, or I guess it was in the paper, um, dead manatee washed up in Narragansett Bay. Yeah, right. Well, you know, what? nobody cares about manatees. Nobody cares really, except for the little baby ones that are cute. Nobody cares about seals or sea lions or any other marine mammals. It's all about whales. Hmm. Hmm. And the Here's others are more... Again. People care about elephants. People do care about elephants. Nobody's written the great elephant novel yet, and maybe there's an opportunity for you there. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Kipling. Kipling made a good stab at it. You, you wrote that That's great true. story. That's you true. wrote the great story about the about the um, uh, about the the, uh, the the little kid who rode the elephant into the jungle to the great meeting of the elephants. Oh, what a great short story that is. <laughs> Anyway, folks, we're uh, we're two minutes past seven o'clock, and uh, is anything anything we want to wind up quick? It looks like uh, it was lots of fun chatting with you. I, I appreciate your coming out and you know your great work contributing to the catalog and and your great work you do generally and and just being so collegial about it all. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It was fun. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It was great. I really enjoy it. Um, and. Um, yeah, definitely great fun to talk with you, and I can't wait to see the show. Well, all right. Karen Madison says that she learned a lot. Well, okay, <laughs> um, and then we'll see you. We'll see you what by and by here at, at the Moby Dick Marathon. You, you're not coming up for that, are you, Bob? I don't usually, but I missed the summer one here. Was there one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mystic uh, Seaport yeah. had its just had its thirty eighth. Uh, Moby Dick Marathon, uh, July 31st to August 1st. And I think this is the 26th, 26th year, if I remember correctly, for New Bedford. Something like 26. Bob, you got to come last to time I did and ask him. I didn't the hear last time, I was going to say the last time I did the Melville Marathon, I did the shortest chapter and I think the longest. And I, I like doing the, the Bulkington chapter because it's only half a page long. But then I read the first lowering and the first lowering. And well, it's like 45 minutes to read that chapter. And I was dying by the end of it. I was ready to drop. So you only get 10 minutes. Isn't that right? You only get 10 minutes to read. Yeah. At, at New Bedford. At, at, New at Bedford, Mystic, yeah. they did it by chapter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So. So you get tired. Well, okay. <laughs> Again, thanks for coming out, and uh, and we'll see you. Well, maybe we'll see you both in January. It'd be great to see you both in January. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, All and right. I'll see you then. Bye. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming out, folks. <laughs>